eNGRP over-the-top routing is actually one of the really cool features that eIGRP offers. I want to say the newer versions of eIGRP because this can only be done in named mode. Right, so we're just going to put named over here. So in named mode, you have this new feature called over the top routing. Now think of how we do things in, let's say, a layer three VPN environment today, or a DM VPN. Right? Let, let's take layer three VPN. So let's assume that this is an L3 VPN here. Right? What needs to happen in order to get maybe these LAN segments here hanging off of R2 and 3 uh, to talk to the LAN segment that's hanging off of R1? What needs to happen? Well, let's say that these guys are obviously EIGRP. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. We need to have a redistribution point here. Here, right we need to get these guys into BGP and then the customer the the uh, the provider edge is going to run a VRF here right and then they're going to transfer this using a VPN v4 address family they're going to do MPLS layer 3 VPN they're going to retransfer it back over here into a VRF into that uh, that virtual routing and forwarding table it's going to get sent on here in BGP and then maybe we're going to have a redistribution point here once again to come back into EIGRP. Now, that's that's standard. That's basically the way that it's done. Now, if you're really, really lucky, this wouldn't be BGP. If you're really lucky, your service provider will let you run EIGRP all the way up to the provider edge, and the provider edge will just essentially say, hey, okay, great, you know, I'm gonna receive these into an EIGRP VRF, and then they will take care of getting it into BGP so that we can use a VPN before address family and transfer it all the way across the cloud to get back, you know. So the bottom line, the point I'm trying to get to is that you have to essentially have a peering here between your customer edge and your provider edge router essentially to transfer these routes. Now, EIGRP over the top essentially makes whatever type of WAN connection you have irrelevant. So if we have a LAN segment here, LAN segment here, LAN segment here, we do not have to peer EIGRP between our customer edge and our provider. All we need is reachability between our two points. So what I mean by that is that this interface here has to be able to get to this interface and this interface. As long as we have that reachability, what EIGRP can actually do is actually form something like this where whatever we have inside the provider so this piece here essentially becomes absolutely irrelevant we have one continuous EIGRP domain regardless of what type of WAN connection we are running and this is actually a really cool really simple feature that EIGRP offers now one of the key things is is that this is only offered in named mode you cannot do this in classic mode now if you have an instance where um, if you have an instance where you have multiple customer edge routers and you, you don't want to do like a, 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 for lack of a better term, a full mesh, you can use what we call an EIGRP route reflector. And it works very similar to the way a BGP route reflector works, where you're going to essentially have that route reflector take in all these routes and that route reflector is going to loop them back out and allow them to be advertised back down to those individual neighbors. Of course, this is going to, this is going to require no split horizon and no next hop self, right? Because you don't want EIGRP to mess with those. Now, EIGRP is not going to mess with the metrics, though, because as this route comes in, EIGRP knows that it's going to be a route reflector, and it's going to go ahead and it's going to send them back out to its various different neighbors. Now, this does require LISP at the data plane. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to actually enable LISP encapsulation, encapsulation, for this to work. But the control plane is still going to be EIGRP. So this is a very, very cool, actually very simple feature to configure. Let's jump into the CLI and see how it works. Okay, now before we actually configure this, I want to just go over some of the changes that uh, that we made here in the topology so that you guys are essentially not going to get confused. You'll notice here that I have some interface differences here on router one on the console. This guy is now going to become gig one on all of these routers here for router one, six, and seven. And the reason is because we need iOS XE in order to run this over the top feature. And so what we've done is we've swapped out router one, six, and seven for the CSR 1000 V or the one KV as I like to call it for short. So now these guys are all going to be 1000 V's and that's how we're going to simulate this and that's how we're going to actually watch this feature. We do use or we are using OSPF 
as a reachability protocol in order to get to these subnets. So these subnets here are going to essentially simulate that public um, that public subnet, if you will. So imagine we have these LAN segments off of router 1, 6, and 7, and essentially right here is our edge. So essentially these guys would be considered our CE routers. And we're talking to our provider, so here's the ISP, and we don't care what's essentially beyond this point. Okay, this is completely irrelevant to us. We, we don't care. It could be Layer 3 VPN, could be a regular provider. We don't really care. The point is, is that these interfaces here, these subnets, are again simulating that public subnet they have to be able to get to one another it's just like forming uh, you know an IPsec VPN or a DMVPN whatever you're going to use as your your source and destination have to be able to reach one another when you enter in the neighbor statement in EIGRP to make this work you're going to enter the the public interface or it could be the loopback I mean it depends on what interface you're going to use bottom line is you have to have reachability to it so let's actually get this working in our environment. What we're going to do is we're going to use router 7 and router 6 first. Those guys are going to be, I want to say, the spokes. I mean, it's not really a hub and spoke, but it, it, it'll help maybe solidify this in your brain. So we're going to use these three loopbacks, loopback 1, 2, and 3, in order to actually test reachability. So we have the same loopbacks set up. Actually, this is the wrong address here, IP address 6.6.6. .6 .6. I was just looking at it and I realized it was the wrong uh, address. This is the loopback address of router 1. So that looks better. So we're going to use these loopback addresses to simulate reachability and make sure that we're actually advertising routes. So let's take router 7 first. So let's say router EIGRP. Now remember this has to be named mode, so we're going to say OTP. That's just what we'll call it. Address family IPv4, autonomous system, we'll call this guy 167. Doesn't really matter what we call it as long as it's consistent. Now I'm going to leave off the network statement for the individual interface, and I'll show you why in just one second. But what I am going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say network 192.168.7.0. So I'm going to enter in a network statement for these three loopback addresses that essentially I want to be injected into my, uh, my EIGRP process. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the neighbor statement, and this neighbor, the IP address that I enter here, is going to be the destination of my route reflector. Okay, or, or, you know, if you're doing this in a point to point, it would be the destination of that router essentially you're going to appear with. So this guy here is going to be our route reflector. So we want this IP address here. So what we'll do is we'll say neighbor 10.1.2.1. Uh, let me say control A and do a pound symbol here. We should be able to ping it. Just make sure. Okay, man. Okay, so we can ping it, so let's go ahead and we'll pop that in. Now we're going to give it the exit interface. Of course, this is going to be gigabit one, and we're going to use this remote option. Now this remote option, now we don't have to use it here in, in the CSR. Actually, I'm sorry, we do. This option we don't have to do. We can say remote and then automatically say Lisp encapsulation. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and give this guy a max hop. So we'll go ahead and say five, and then we'll say Lisp encapsulation. Now. You can go ahead and hit enter here, but I never do. I always go ahead and give this guy a Lisp ID. Uh, it's just kind of the best practice. If you guys get this error message, don't worry. This is actually a known bug uh, in the version of code that I'm running from Cisco. I forget the bug ID off the top of my head, but this is a known bug. I've looked it up before to make sure that everything was... Uh, was working right. You'll see though that we do get a, a Lisp interface. If I say do show IP interface brief E assigned, we are going to get a Lisp 1 interface and that one I believe corresponds with the ID that we just set up. So here we have a Lisp ID, a, li a Lisp interface that's uh, that's lit up. So let's go ahead and we'll go over to router 6. We'll do the same thing. So router EIGRP OTP, address family IPv4, autonomous system 167. We'll, oh, you know what? I forgot to show you. Uh, do show run section router EIGRP. Remember I said I was going to leave off the network statement for that public interface? Well, essentially, that's what's happened, right? So when I go ahead and I enter in this neighbor statement, automatically, I'm going to get a slash 24 network statement uh, for that individual interface. I don't have to do that. I mean, I could enter a slash 32 if I wanted to. In fact, we'll do that on router 6. So I'll say network uh, 10.4.6.6.000. Zero. Uh, I will go ahead and say network 192.168.6.0. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here. I'll just grab this exact uh, command here and I'll go ahead and pop it in. So let's say do show run section router EIGRP. 
and you can see that it auto magically again adds that statement so you know you can add it but you don't really need it it can cause problems so we'll just go ahead you saw that we got a failure notice up here uh, somewhere Yep, so Lisp EIGRP failed. So, you know, I just generally leave it off to not cause any issues. Do show run section router EIGRP. And normally I like to spell like a normal human. So generally I'll just leave this and I'll let uh, I'll let everything do its thing. I, I don't like to overcomplicate it. So now that that's finished, let's go over to router one and I'll say router EIGRP. Now remember this guy is going to be our route reflector. So this guy's gonna have a little bit different configuration. Uh, we'll say autonomous system 167. First thing I'm gonna do is say network 192.168.1.0. These are the three loopback addresses that I essentially wanna advertise. Now, the one thing, well, there's multiple things. The one thing that I want you to remember above all is the fact that EIGRP has a split horizon rule. So let me say split horizon. EIGRP will not advertise a route on an interface where he received it, right? So he's going to come out here, he's going to try to re-advertise this, and he's going to essentially hit a wall and say, nope, that's not allowed. And that's because of the split horizon rule. So what's going to happen is that EIGRP, router 7 is going to advertise these routes in to the gig 1 interface of router, router 1, and then out of that same gig one interface router one wants to be able to send them over here to router six but he can't do that because of split horizon so that's one thing we have to essentially turn off the other thing that we have to turn off is the next hop self so this is another thing I want you to remember think of this as you implementing this in a DMVPN because in a DMVPN you have to remember to turn off the same two things right because you don't want router one to change the next hop to itself thereby making r6 come to router one in order to get over to router seven you want these guys to have direct reachability between one another okay so keep that in mind as you do this so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say AF interface and I'm gonna say gig one and I'm gonna say no split horizon and I'm gonna say no next top self the wrong key no next top self okay now I'm gonna use or I need to use this remote neighbors command and I'm gonna source it or I need to source it from the gig one interface I need to be able to tell router one where to expect these messages. So I'm going to say unicast listen, that's the next command we're going to need, followed by Lisp encapsulation and of course that same router ID. Now, there are other options you can use. For example, the max neighbors, being that this guy is a uh, a route reflector, you could say, okay, my Lisp ID is, is going to be one and I want to allow the max neighbors to be two or three or four or whatever you want that number to be. You can also set up an ACL if you want it to be a little bit more secure. You could say, listen, only these two or three neighbors, so I'm going to set a max neighbors of three and then maybe I'm going to set up an allow list and say I only want these individual interfaces or, or these particular public addresses to form a neighborship. So these are the options that you could choose here. Okay. So once we do this, in theory, what we should see, if everything's working properly, is we should see, again, remember, ignore these error messages. This is actually a bug. We should see that router 1 forms an adjacency with both router 6 and router 7. And again, this is regardless what's going on in the service provider. So essentially consider these guys here. Let me pick a dark color. Essentially, whatever's going on in here, we don't care about, okay? To us, all we care about is the fact that these interfaces here can reach one another and we're forming essentially a virtual EIGRP tunnel, if you will, through our service provider. And you could be running anything. It could be the internet, it could be a layer 3 VPN, we don't care. Okay, there's no redistribution here, which is the nice thing. You can go right from your internal EIGRP process across your service provider right to the next site, and it's almost like a point-to-point, -point, if you will. Let's say do show IP EIGRP neighbors, and we can see that we have two neighbors. We have 10.5.7.7, that's router 7, and router 6. Q count is zero, which is a good thing. Let's say do show IP route EIGRP, and you can see we have a total of six loopback addresses. We have the three loopback addresses coming in from router 6. It lets us know that this is coming in over Lisp, and it gives us that ID, the ID that we, the ID that we set up. And here are the loopback addresses for seven. Let's check what uh, the seven router table looks like. Do show IP route EIGRP. You can see that we have three or, or a set of six loopback addresses: three from router one and three from router six. But take a look at the next hop, and that's the important thing. The next hop for router seven is not router one. Okay, the next hop for router seven is actually the direct 
outside interface here of router 6. So in theory, I should be able to say ping 192.168.6.1 and I should be able to source that from our loopback 3 address and we have direct reachability. I should be able to ping 192 .168.1.1 source from our loopback one. Remember, we have the same interface as Dushu IP interface brief E assigned. We have the same three loopback addresses. So I am able, again, just to prove 192.168.6.3 from our loopback three. So I'm going to source my traffic from this interface over to router 6 and we have direct reachability. So at this point, our over-the-top routing in EIGRP is working. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. See you guys in the next one.